Okay, everyone, what's up? Golda here. And I'm going to be going over the big 12 game main slate that we have here on uh, Tuesday, uh, May 16th. Got a lot of arms. <sighs> Pretty dissimilar to yesterday. Uh, a lot of arms on the mound here. Um, some decent tournament spots I think you can get to on the mound. Maybe a couple of pivots that you could make to get off of some ownership uh, if necessary. Because there's probably a pretty popular game that you're likely going to want to get to today down here at Coors Field. Um, we have a rookie making his debut, Brandon Williamson. Kid's got an XFIP north of six in the last couple of years in the minors. So um, that's not good. And you also have a uh, kind of a bullpen game over here from Colorado. So might need to make some ownership pivots here on the mound, um, as always on a 12 game slate, you can make plenty of ownership pivots if necessary with your hitters uh, and your stacks. L fewer spots to get to today than perhaps yesterday when we saw a lot of runs scored last night. Um, kind of talked about that. Uh, I mean, I don't know, that's the impression that I got yesterday coming out of the, the, the video and um, analysis that I was really thrilled about any of the pitchers on the mound. Three of them made me look like an idiot. Um, and an offense or two made me look kind of stupid too. So, uh, you know, we have that. But today I think it's going to be a little bit different in that we've got plenty of arms here that are just less likely to get blown apart uh, like a lot of the guys did yesterday, right? So that said, there's still some attackable spots. Um, and with full 12 games on the docket, let's just, uh, let's just get into it here. So we'll start with Yankees of Toronto, uh, once again, and we have kind of a really, and very interesting spot, I think, uh, with Domingo Herman on the mound here against the Blue Jays. Um, now Domingo, he's like, he's been excellent, uh, so far this season, high strikeout rate, throwing a lot of strikes and getting a boatload of chase, very high swinging strike rate. This curveball changeup mix has been fantastic for him. Now, he still gives up a little bit of power, and that's really how we've attacked Herman in the past, right? Is, I mean, mostly with righties, at least this season. In the past, this ISO number, realized ISO, has been north of 200 really to both sides. And the X ISO now, based on StatCast metrics, is now down under 170 in aggregate. So this is very encouraging from Herman. Uh, and he's had a couple of very good starts this season. So I think we can consider if we need to get to this mid-range... I'm um, not sure I'd go out of my way to target this necessarily because this is still Toronto. They're still a, kind of a difficult matchup. But he's been fantastic um, with the swing and miss against the right side. Like I said, he still give up a little bit of power and a little bit of hard contact with some balls in the air. And that's really due to the lack of elite four-seam command here. He's struggling the most with this pitch, as he has in the past. But... He's got the two-seamer now that he's, getting, that he's getting a, a good bit of value with. And he can go to that if he's not feeling this four-seamer, not spotting it, uh, kind of floating over the middle of the plate a little bit, just not comfortable. Um, but the changeup and the curveball have been excellent. And he's kind of similar to like a, like a Charlie Morton um, and throwing this curveball at a Wainwright, right, north of 40% of the time. It's an excellent pitch. He's got incredible whiffs on it. Don't have that data here in the sheet but uh so you just have to trust me there um so the the mix the the, uh, the breaking in the in the off-speed mix here has been very good for him and he's thrown a lot of strikes like i said with huge chase um we've talked about attacking toronto with breaking pitches they've been very attackable once again this season in particular with a, a slider but a curveball similar pitch and similar break um you can attack with that as well, and he'll throw this righty-righty change up a little bit. It could be a very devastating pitch to same-handed hitters if it's good, and this is a pretty good change. So I think we could potentially consider some Domingo Herman on the mound tonight uh, against Toronto. If you land on this 
Um, this ownership, I think, is too low for the upside that he offers in this particular matchup. Now, generally, yeah, we don't want to go after Toronto. 22% aggregate K rate against righties, 107 WRC+, plus, hit the baseball hard, and they're mostly on a line and, and in the air here. So it's it's fine. Um, their number, their aggregate numbers against Toronto, or against righties, rather, for Toronto. 326 Woba, hitting for about a 253 average. So mostly just average pretty much everywhere. But this is kind of, I would say, a, a below average spot against Vermont. He does give up a little bit of pop. But we see over here that he's just got a 229 expected batting average in aggregate, 310 X Woba. And I talked about the, the X ISO, sub 170 now with a 26% K rate. These are really, really good numbers. And despite a slightly elevated hard contact rate, we can, I think we could attack this and consider this as a super off the board tournament play uh, when we've got a lot of really chalky arms. Uh, that will end up going over. So I think this is in play. Um, it's you probably have to force some of this in because it like he doesn't project well. Teams usually or pitchers usually don't against um, against Toronto, of course, because of the lack of raw strikeout stuff. But it's there for Herman, and this curveball changeup mix has been very equitable for him so far. So I think this is playable. Uh, probably going to take me off most of Toronto, I would say. And it really doesn't change because every single day they have a they're like the Yankees of the last several years. Um, their their implied run total is, is north of five every single day. It doesn't matter who it is uh, or who they get on the mound on the other side. But at these price tags, I'm not sure I want to go after any of the Blue Jays and play Bo Bichette. His price has come down. He's back to 52 now. But Vladdy's still very expensive, 57. Matt Chapman still at 59. He's been by far their best hitter, so he would be the one I'd be like pretty okay with paying that elevated price tag for. It's a good price on Springer, yeah, at at 44. He's been struggling a little bit though. Um, Dalton Varsho still at a playable 4100. So if you'd like to get to some Toronto as a very off the board stack, they're well down the list I think, but just kind of you know middle of the road so far. Um, I don't think this is horrible going after him because historically he has still given up some power. Uh, Herman and some hard contact with some balls in the air, so it's it's still reasonable, but he's thrown a, a lot more strikes this year, and the control has been far better than in the past. So uh, I would probably prefer to side with Herman here than the Blue Jays. Um, I think it's going to be pretty hard to to get to the Jays tonight. Kevin Gosman is going on the mound for Toronto, and I don't think it's going to be very hard to get to him. However, 10-7, I like this. Um, K stuff has been fantastic this year, of course. 34% aggregate K rate. Still doesn't walk people. He's had a couple of clunkers here and there where he just he floating this splitter and it's up in the strike zone and he just gets blasted. Uh, slider has been well below average, certainly for him. It's usually a pretty okay pitch. Uh, and really his moneymaker is the splitter. So he's not eking as much value out of this pitch as he normally does, despite having a lot of whiffs still and a very high aggregate K rate. The, the expected metrics, 230 average, 284 X Woba, and a 171 X ISO, still very strong. Still giving up some hard contact, and he'll do that, but he stays down in the strike zone, and it's, it's usually something that we can deal with in the 30 to 35% range. Uh, when you're getting ground balls. When we get up into the 40% range, as he is so far in this shorter sample against lefties, that's when we kind of need to take note. And that's because the, he's not burying the splitter enough. And he'll still get on the barrel a little bit with this four-seamer here. That's why we see an elevated barrel rate pushing 10%. That's kind of the threshold that we look for. Anything above 10%, uh, that's when alarm bells should start to go off. But... Um, Gosman has been fantastic. He's going deeper into games this year. And the Yankees have been attackable with right-handers that have high strikeout stuff uh, really all season. Look at this chase rate. It's always been elite for Gosman. This is one of the highest numbers, if not the highest number, in baseball for a starting pitcher. The chase rate is just out of control high. And that's really what you want to see. It's because of the splitter. So despite the fact that he's not eking all of the value on the split itself, so far this year, 
he's still got the chase, and he's still got the swinging strikes, and the CSW itself still north of 30%. So I think it's a very playable spot, and sub-20% ownership, uh, I think it's fine. You're going to see ownership really spread apart with all of the guys up at the top today, uh, but I think Gosman's very playable at 10-7, um, even against the Yankees, who as we've mentioned, are getting a little bit healthier. They put up a real crooked number last night, but that was against Alec Manoa, who has struggled this season. Gosman has been far, far better. Yankees overall just average, right? 100 WRC+. plus, Below average strikeout rate, or above average, depending on how you look at it, 22% here. Walk rate about average. Woba, BABIP, ISO. Hard contact a little elevated, yeah, sure. But not creating so much just yet. So, um... As we get into the summer here and, and the lineup is healthier and they start really start clicking, these numbers will probably start to drift up, uh, at least the production. They're still going to hit for some power, but um, overall, I mean, most of that's still going to come from like a, a Judge or, or a Rizzo or something like that. Uh, if you did want to get off of some of this ownership from Gosman, probably not totally necessary today. Cause, again, it's full 12-game slate probably don't need to do that um, and look for deliberate leverage stacks against really good arms. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of stacks later that we might be able to consider. But in this particular spot, yeah, you can play Judge. You can play him every day. You can play Rizzo against pretty much every righty in baseball. Low strikeout rate, a lot of pop. And seeing the baseball now, uh, a little bit better is Rizzo down to 4,600 today. Uh, obviously a below average matchup, but he's still okay. Jake Bauer is still 2,000, so if you need to make the judge and Rizzo plays a little bit cheaper, I think that's a reasonable consideration to make a little short stack in the Yankees, probably off of full stacks. Um, as I said, the, the Yankees are pretty well down the list. We don't want to go after Gosman in, in most scenarios. Uh, okay, Tampa and the Mets. Man, the Mets have been bad. Tampa has... Of course, still been good. They're just going with Jalen Beeks as an opener here today. It's going to be Yanni Chirinos. That'll come in after him. And I don't know. I'm not super thrilled about um, attacking the Rays in a bullpen game with the Mets. Uh, the Mets, is, Mets offense is really built for contact and run production uh, rather than raw power. Even though they've got some guys that can hit it over the wall. Notably Pete Alonzo, a little bit of Frankie Lindor, of course. But everybody else, mostly just a contact hitter. Uh, even Starling Marte anymore, not hitting the baseball over the wall. They do have some pop from, like, Frankie Alvarez behind the plate. Um, you know, a couple guys here and there. Brett Beatty, a little bit of pop. You know, things like that. But for the most part, they've got Nimmo. They've got Jeff McNeil. They've got Mark Kana, Guys with historically pretty low slugging and and iso rates so generally don't want to be going after tampa the mets going to be pretty middling as well in terms of a raw stack just because it's a bullpen game and the guys they're bringing in here jalen beeks and yanni chirinos uh well they're they haven't quite crossed the threshold into equitable enough stuff to make them a starter or keep them a starter they've experimented with both of these guys in the past jalen and Chirinos as starters, but they haven't quite been able to make it work. Jalen Beeks mostly because the strikeout rate is pretty low. He's only going to go about an inning or two. And, of course, like we're not playing openers. And on a full 12-game slate, you're not playing the long reliever coming in after them uh, against a team that doesn't really strike out, despite the fact that they don't have a lot of power. Still just 20% K rate. Average production. Not enough hard contact, but like we said, a lot of them are... Um, you know, they're just going to hit for a, li a little bit of average, a lot of these guys, um, and less so on the power. You can get to a Pete Alonso, sure, 5,300. That's a much more playable price tag. Now you can play some Frankie uh, Lindor, that is, at 47. If you want to play Frankie Alvarez behind the plate, that's okay at 28. He's got probably, I mean, top three pop for a catcher. Uh, we'll see if he's in the lead in the list it might be like a Tomas Nito. Who knows what Showalter is going to do? Uh, they screw around all kinds. But uh, probably off the Mets most often in stacks. going to be pretty hard to get to them just because they don't hit for a lot of power. 10-5 um, on the mound for Verlander. Ay -ay -ay. He's one of these guys that we can we can get up to uh, up above 10, of course. Like you've got Kershaw who we'll get to, and we just talked about Gosman. 
Verlander might kind of be on the shelf here for me today. I don't like going after Tampa pretty much at all with almost anybody. Um, now, Verlander would qualify as one of the guys that I, I would very well consider. Obviously, the numbers here in the sheet, they're just total noise. It's just this year's sample. So we can ignore all of this. But historically, he's a four-seamer slider curveball guy. Uh, staying off of the change, at least so far in his first couple of starts, um, this has been a, a low-ish usage pitch for him in the past. And mostly a four-seamer slider guy that gives him a a slight fly ball lean. He'll use this curveball, of course two of course um and the strikeout stuff really showed up in his last start after his first one which was you know just kind of a all right let's get back into the swing of things um he struck out i believe what seven and in seven innings against the reds production suppression was there just gave up one earned run and did go the full seven innings right so um he's stretched out and this is verlander and as long as verlander is healthy um He's always had excellent mechanics on the mound, and it really prevented him from having to have TJ until he was 40, you know. So uh, the mechanics have always been great, and as long as he's got all of that going, there's really not a lot of susceptibility and attack ability uh, for Verlander. He will give up some fly balls, um, and he will get on the barrel a little bit sometimes. So we can get to some Tampa if you are just like homer hunting. But uh, these price tags are going to make it really difficult. Wander's 59. Brandon Lau still 47. Not my favorite there. He's going to strike out a lot in this matchup. Uh, Randy Rosarena, he's been fantastic this season, hitting both righties and lefties very well. 55, he's one of the better plays from Tampa, if you get there, I think. Josh Lowe, 4,900, pretty expensive there. Um, and the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, not too thrilling to go after Verlander with. So uh, I think he's fine to mix into your pools at 10-5. Sometimes when you've got a bunch of guys in the upper range that are all projecting north of 20 points and they're all kind of getting ownership, sometimes you just got to take some stands. Um, I think Verlander would probably be at the top of my list to X out of the pool if I had to, and I would just prefer to get to like a, a Kershaw or, uh, or a Gosman. Um, because this matchup in particular, like this is the best team in baseball over here, uh, offensively. And I don't generally don't want to go after this. Um, it's kind of like Houston from the last several years. They're very hard to play pitchers against, uh, Verlander does qualify, so it's fine, but at elevated ownership, it might be a little, uh, aggressive here. So not my favorite to getting to, um, really any offense in this game for the most part. I do like Pete Alonzo though at 53. I think he, that's a, a pretty viable play. Okay, Seattle and Boston on the mound. Um, Seattle's popping really hard here against Nick Pavetta. We'll get to him in a sec. Luis Castillo not popping really hard. 10000 Price really hasn't changed. And he's one of these guys. It's going to make it virtually impossible if you're just building teams um, to get to today. The, this projection so far, I've been waiting for it to come up all throughout the morning here. It's just not so far and uh it's going to make it pretty much impossible to land on him unless you only have 10,000 and you're just like okay well let's do it uh is a terrible matchup and he's really struggling still with the changeup. these problems are creeping back up despite the value the plus value that he had on it really a lot of last year it's still super suspect and he comes in look like three quarters and and submarines with this change up and he floats it a lot of the times right in the middle of the damn plate uh, and he doesn't get any value out of it. He throws it way too much. He needs to probably develop a cutter because the slider is a very good pitch. He can he can survive with a three fastball and one secondary pitch offering. But this this changeup has been a problem for him his entire career. Now he's not giving up at least in this short sample a lot of the power that he has historically and he's still got whiffs because the four seamer two seamer and slider that he's throwing to both sides of the plate have really all been good but the the change of value is just not getting whiffs and it's it's not um the ground ball pitch that you'd really like left-handers to be rolling over on uh, at least for him since he comes in at the sort of different release point the flattened out release point um, you know, the, all that said, the aggregate numbers still look great for Castillo. Uh, he has made plus changes in the pitch mix, and he's throwing more of the good pitches and, and less of the bad, right, that we talked about in his last couple starts. Um, so that's good, but 
still needs to move away far, far away from this bad changeup. It's just no value for him. So uh, he's got to figure something out here, and that makes him a little bit attackable with a good team against right-handed pitching. They've hit change-ups in particular exceptionally well this year, about three-quarters of an out above average. Uh, and for a team, that's a really strong number. 113 aggregate WRC plus here, 19% K rate, 31% hard, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball, all fine there. But a 187 ISO and a 343 WOBA, uh, they're hitting for a lot of average here, 272 aggregate, and that's what makes them really difficult to go after usually, um, unless you've got guys that have strikeout stuff. Now, Luis Castillo does qualify there, and despite the low projection, he's got super low ownership commensurately, right? So this makes it like he's going to be totally forgotten up at this up at this range. We can pop back over to the um, the kind of overview page here you see Kershaw Gosman Verlander and Javier who we'll get to in a little bit all of those guys garnering all the ownership and they should because you got a six and a seven point projection delta here uh for Castillo but that doesn't that makes Castillo a pretty damn strong tournament play based on the ownership alone like he obviously has the upside to pop through this 14 15 point projection um and unfortunately you probably need all three of the other guys at their ownership levels to underperform but it's it's totally reasonable like he doesn't have to outperform every single one of them be the highest scoring pitcher for you in this range or or anything like that right he just has to allow you to save enough money to make the rest of your lineup build work and you get the the boon of sub five percent ownership here so um this makes him a good tournament play in a very difficult matchup don't get me wrong i do not like going after boston uh, especially with guys with a, a sub par off speed pitch um the the slider and fastball mix here will allow him to survive so uh, I think it's an okay tournament play if you land on this. I'm not going to go out of my way and force this in and, because it, it'd be, like I said, very, very difficult. Um, and you'll probably just get 0% if you just build a bunch of teams here. Um, does that mean you can get to Boston? I mean, I don't really want to go after Castillo generally. Uh, sure, you can play Devers against everybody. That's not a problem. Yoshida got a day off yesterday, but he's still 5,600. Alex Verdugo doesn't strike out a lot. He's 5,000, though. Um, historically not a lot of power, hitting for a little bit more this season, but eh. Jaron Duran's been great. They let him off yesterday with uh, Yoshida getting a, a breather. But he's still 3,900. He's going to strike out a lot in this matchup. Um, so will Tristan Casas, you know. So you can make a stack happen, but you're not getting any leverage on Castillo, and that's really how I'd prefer to attack this because I respect this arm, and I like playing him. He's got good stuff here. And a lot of strikeout stuff. So I think I'd prefer to side with Castillo if I had to choose. Um, but I don't like going after Boston, and I really don't like stacking against Castillo in general. On the other side, 6,600 for Pavetta. I do like stacking against him. And we are seeing a lot of love come to Seattle here in the early going. We'll um, give you a kind of a sneak peek of something we're building in the background. This is kind of the uh, the aggregate cheats value scores. And and their roughs top stack percentage based on uh, based on that a that value score, along with their ownership here. And this is kind of where we're falling um, so far in very early ownership runs here today. Uh, this is the total price tag of each of the uh, the top five guys. Um, you can see here that's what the stacks look like here in the early going. Um, and you see, so let's get kind of get to the point here that Seattle's coming in as the second best value on the slate. Of course, we'll get to Colorado and Cincinnati here at very high ownership for them. They're definitely popping in the top three, of course, but Seattle right there in the middle, right? So um, that's because Nick Pavetta has been getting absolutely blasted this entire season. So much hard contact. He's always given up a little bit of hard contact and a lot of fly balls. In aggregate this year, 080 ground ball to fly ball, that hasn't changed, really to both sides of the plate. But the hard contact pitch info rate is at 41.5%. Um, this is a huge, huge number. He's given up an aggregate two, two homers per nine, mostly to lefties, but he's given it up to righties as well. 316 realized ISO to the left side with a 267 average, 396 Woba. K rate, sure, to the left side, but 
you kind of throw all that out the window when he's given up this many fly balls and this much hard contact. No soft contact induced whatsoever. Uh, and he got beat up really, really good by Atlanta in his last start. Hot again in in Boston tonight, pushing 80 degrees. So I think you're going to be able to see some offense. This is why Seattle's popping so hard. He gives up 44% hard contact to the right side, too, with a 193 realized ISO and a far lower strikeout rate. So you can play everybody on, on Seattle over here. And ownership-wise, they're coming in third as – our little graphic kind of displayed over there. Uh, we'll see how that shakes out over the rest of the day, but you're still going to have very high ownership come to both Colorado and Cincinnati. So you might be able to get them, you know, a couple of these guys at least, off the board a little bit. You're going to see at shortstop in particular, Matt McClain garner all the ownership since his price hasn't changed. He's still 2000 So a fine tournament pivot there at least in, with stacks, could be a J.P. Crawford. He's at 3,300. They're still going to lead him off, almost certainly. He's been fine in the leadoff. And last season, he went on about a month and a half run where they were leading him off. You're paying near nearly 5K for J.P. Crawford at the top of the lineup. So um, he's got history there, and he's a perfectly capable leadoff hitter against a guy that's going to give it up to the left side of the plate. So that's a fine tournament pivot, for example. Uh, the rest of the guys... For Seattle, you can play all of them. Ty France still very playable. Uh, he's got like a 12, 13 game hit streak or, or 14 or something. Uh, you may have zeroed yesterday. Uh, I'm not totally sure off the top of my head, but in any case, he's been seeing the baseball. And Julio has um, kind of picking things up a little bit as well. Ty Oscar is still terrible uh, and still chasing a crap load. Um, but this is a high upside spot because the chase rate is well under 30% for Pavetta. For Pavetta. And he's always given up pop to the right side, going back to his, his Phillies days. Um, so he's very attackable with both sides of the plate here. I know Cal Raleigh hit two bombs last night, but he got a price drop to 4,200. He'll be in there again. Uh, service gives him a day off after he hits two jacks at, at Fenway. I mean, I don't know what we're doing. But you can play Kelnick. There's a high upside spot for him. 47, not the greatest price, but once again, there's – this is a plus matchup. So you can play everybody from Seattle, and that's why they're popping so hard in the betting markets and in terms of the implied run totals and all that jazz. Uh, but fundamentally, this is a killer spot. So I'm totally staying off of Pavetta. I don't think there's any upside for him in this particular matchup. And I would expect Seattle to, to really get after him tonight. So um, mostly just Seattle here, I guess. You could run some... You know, if Seattle pops really hard in the ownership, you could run some correlated Luis Castillo teams, get a little bit of exposure here. I don't think that's bad at all. Um, but this is a, admittedly a difficult matchup. You could also see, due to this low projection, it kind of implies that Boston's going to be able to get to Castillo tonight. Um, you know, but as I mentioned, with the high price tags on Boston, you don't really want to play them. <laughs> you know, so that also kind of implies that Luis Castillo could be a good tournament play. You know, so... Um, some different ways to play this, mostly just the Mariners here, though, I think. Uh, but don't be surprised if, if Boston makes a little bit of a run. Okay, Milwaukee and St. Louis, Wade Miley on the mound. Um, I think I would be surprised if Wade Miley makes a run here <laughs> against the Cardinals. Uh, this offense, man, we talked about this yesterday. Like, you do not want to go after this team when they are clicking. It's every single one of them now, and they're insanely difficult to get through um, when they're all seeing the baseball as they are. Like, Tommy Edmond got there last night. Um, of course, Arenado got there last night. Nolan Gorman got there last night. Uh, everybody has just been fantastic. Uh, Lars got there. Paul DeYoung has had a good start. Um, you know, Contreras has been much better recently. Paul Goldschmidt's Paul Goldschmidt. You know, like, so you got to pay for a couple of these guys if you want to stack against Wade Miley. I generally don't, uh, but I don't want to fade this offense in general when they're when they're rolling this hard. And we talked about this. If this hard contact rate persists as it, as it will, um, you know, they've got a, this hard contact rate to both sides of the plate here. We see against everybody, it's 36%. So it's 36% to both sides. And if it's this hard or, you know, they're hitting the baseball this hard, this WRC plus number is going to come up with a low strikeout rate, the ISO, the WOBA, the average, they've been hitting for average all season the WRC plus will come up and we've seen over the last couple of weeks that the Cardinals are really starting to put it together offensively. And they finally got a good start from one of their starting pitchers last night. Jack Flaherty made me look like an idiot too. Um, 
it doesn't mean I'm going to stop stacking against him. Uh, Wade Miley, I generally don't like stacking against him, however, despite the my love for the Cardinals' offense here. I I would certainly do it. He's having a lot of trouble throwing strike one here this, this season. And this is a full seven starts now, 40 innings. Like, this strike one rate converges the fastest out of anything. Um, and this is 50% here. This is a big problem. He's throwing a lot of junk still, but he's mostly four-seamer cutter change. Getting some value out of those three, but the slider curveball mix is like kind of meh. He doesn't throw the curveball a lot. That's fine. Uh, sliders have not really been great. So he's struggling with getting a a lot of value out of a, a breaking pitch and, and keeping the ball on the ground, which has really been Wade Miley's strength most of his career. And as we see here, an 080 ground ball to fly ball now. So not getting any ground balls out of the cutter change up and the lack of a slider here, it, it's making it difficult for Wade Miley. He's actually been blown apart in a couple of his starts this season. Um, it's not really translating the bad strike one rate to a full-on walk rate, but this hasn't fixed itself, right? And as I mentioned, this, like, you throw strike one or you throw a first pitch to every single hitter you face. So this is the most um, predictive in terms of like a, a plate discipline number, right? Uh, of all of these stats here. So as long as this number persists at such a low figure, sub 50%, the walk rate will eventually come up because he's not getting value out of secondary offerings outside of the changeup. Yeah. He's throwing that 25% of the time, but you can't survive with just fastballs and a changeup. Um, I mean, you could survive, but you can't eke out value, right? And eventually, you'll you'll start walking people if this strike one rate stays this low, just because you put yourself in difficult counts. If you don't have the breaking stuff to get out of those holes, it's going to make it that much more difficult for you. So Wade Miley struggling here in the early going. So I, I mean, you certainly can't play him. He doesn't have a raw strikeout rate as it is. Um, so despite all of that nonsense, you know, just look at the real important numbers here, 14.5% K rate, 6.7% swinging strike rate, 24% CSW, no thank you, I'm not dealing with this um, at all against this uh, very hot offense over here. Jordan Montgomery on the mound for the card, 7,400, I think you can play this here tonight. Uh, now, despite the fact that he's just got a pretty average strikeout rate, he kind of really always has. It's been lower historically to the right side, and he'll give up a little bit more power, a little bit more contact to them for sure. Um, so these numbers are mostly similar to where they have been maybe a little elevated in the hard contact here. It's a shorter sample. I mean, 162 hitters, not all that short, though. 195 ISO is about in the same range where he's always been. He's he been elite historically against lefties. So this is noise. Um, still not giving up any power, but the, the low strikeout rate against lefty, this is about six ticks lower than his um, seasonal averages from the last couple of years, right? So just 37 hitters here. It's total noise here in the early season, um, early parts of the season. I know it's eight starts, but still pretty early. Still throwing strike one, still not walking people. Uh, he will get this change up down in the strike zone, and he will figure out the, the curveball uh, value here, and that's what keeps him elite against the left side. So you you don't want to deal with any lefties from the Brewers over here, and the Brewers have been awful against lefties all season. So I think this is playable at 7,400 for Montgomery. Uh, high projection here, and this projection alone is projecting three points higher than Luis Castillo, for example, at 2,600 cheaper. So um, I'd much rather get to him. I think this is probably more of a cash play. Um, in tournaments, I, I kind of have a little bit of concern with raw upside for Montgomery, just because the strikeout rate against righties historically has been low, and I'm still kind of expecting the Brewers to be a little bit better against lefties going forward. Um, now, we're, we're seeing the WRC Plus creep up a little bit. It's been in the 60s before this, but um, hitting the baseball a little bit harder, 32% aggregate, hard contact, but it's still on the ground for the most part. And until they start to lift the baseball, the run creation really isn't going to come up. They're only hitting for 210 average, so they're really a strikeout and a very low efficiency type of team against left-handers here. Very low power, so they're not hitting the baseball in the air and over the wall. So that makes Jordan Montgomery with a high ground ball rate himself very playable here. As I mentioned, it's always been elite to lefties. It's north of two, I think. 
uh, in aggregate for him. He's a little bit more of a fly ball lean relative to the left side, at least, against the right side. But he still has a uh, a plus ground ball number here. So um, I think you can play some Jordan Montgomery here in the mid-range tonight. We're seeing the, the ownership creep up a little bit here in the early going. Started the day at about uh, 14 15%. Starting to creep up a little. Um so if this spikes too hard, I'd probably rather just get to it in cash than tournaments because I think some other guys might have a little bit more upside. But this, is, this team over here, the Brewers, they've been dreadful against left-handed pitching. You could play Montgomery in tournaments. He has 25 and 30-point upside here in this particular matchup. So I think this is fine. So I'd like the Cardinals for the most part uh, and some Montgomery. Pretty much none of the Brewers. Um, maybe a righty here or there, like an Owen Miller. They'll probably lead him off 2,500, 2,600 or whatever. Uh, I think that's fine, but mostly just the Cards. Okay, let's move on. Atlanta and Texas. Uh, Jared Schuster on the mound for the Braves, making his third start of the season. Another just kind of spot start. Um, we'll see if they keep him in the rotation. Everybody's hurt all across baseball, so who knows what the hell's going on. Um, 5,500 for him. Don't think you can play this. I, I want to get to some Texas here. And Texas really coming in and middling in both value and ownership. Value because it's 5,900 or 5,800, 58 for Marcus Semien. And 54 for Adelis Garcia. So two very expensive bats there who you'd like to be playing against left-handed pitching. Josh Young's 4,700 now. Uh, Jonah Heim, 4,500, right? So some pretty expensive pieces. We may very well get Corey Seager back tonight. We'll see if they want what they want to do. I, I would probably just leave him on the shelf, give him one more day because they got the lefty going here, maybe pinch hit him or something. Um, But I probably wouldn't start him. I'd just let him... Uh, you know, get a, a fresh start against a righty, put him in a good spot coming off the DL, but uh, he's supposedly ready to go. Um, so they're probably getting their, their best raw hitter back um, either tonight or tomorrow. So I don't want to be dealing with even cheap pitchers uh, against Texas. Their numbers against lefties really all season have been pretty damn good. One, uh, 124 WRC plus here. They'll strike out a little bit more, but Schuster's not going to throw it past them really. They're walking a lot. 33% aggregate hard contact rate with a 351 Woba, high, high average as well. So this is a very dangerous team to go after uh, with left-handers. And I would like to get to some of them tonight. Not sure how that's really going to play out uh, with that pretty expensive price. You play Nate Low too, 4,500. He's fine. They're an off-the-board tournament stack, but I think there's a lot of upside in this particular matchup. Um against uh, Jared Schuster. The, he's a four-seamer slider change guy, but really no value here so far. We can't really take much out of the out of the value metrics, of course. Um, but the strike one rate for him is also pretty low, and he's had pretty significant issues with throwing strikes deeper into count also. Uh, no whiffs just yet, um, so some susceptibility and just putting runners on base and pitching to a good bit of contact here so far, 79% in this short, you know, whatever, eight and two-thirds sample. Um, but he's attackable, definitely, with Semyon, Garcia, Josh Young, Jonah Heim. We like him a little bit better from the right side of the plate. Uh, kind of an elevated price tag, but he's much better hitter against lefties than he is against righties. Zeke Duran, he'll probably be in there uh, tonight if uh, if they give Seager the day off. Maybe they'll DH him. I mean, who knows? But uh, he's at a playable 3,300. I like that spot a little bit. Uh, Duran's problem is Chase, and we don't have a lot of Chase coming from Schuster here. So uh, I think we can get to some Texas. Atlanta on the other side, um, they get Dane Dunning tonight, and I think this is probably the only guy down here in this very cheap range, 5,300 on the mound for him, that you could consider playing. Uh, he's got excellent value out of the sinker cutter mix so far. Changeup's been very good too. Pretty noisy and outs above average relative to the field here in the shortish sample uh, because he's got some bullpen appearances and just the two starts but uh he went four and two thirds i believe uh in his last start let's check no he went a full six uh against seattle and struck out five so historically dane dunning not much of a pure whiff kind of guy but he did add in this cutter and made some changes in the pitch mix i think we talked about this in his in his last appearance uh against seattle um really good value on this cutter here so I'm not sure I want to go out of my way to be targeting or to be playing Atlanta tonight. You Don't get me wrong. You can play them every single day. Like last night, we mentioned if you could make it happen, they put up another 10 spot and just hit the ball over the wall. Every one of them does it. 
and they're all seeing the baseball very well. So historically, Dane Dunning going to pitch to a good bit of contact. He's not throwing as much garbage as he has in the past. Like he's eliminated the four seamer. He, I believe, threw a little bit of a split historically as well. But he's got five pitches here, three of them offering a lot of value. He's very confident in this cutter so far this season. And the slider will probably follow as well since they're pretty similar pitches. And that is a full 83% of the arsenal nearly for him. So changeup's going to help him neutralize some power to the left side. That's Matt Olson, Eddie Rosario, Michael Harris kind of guys. Um, uh, excuse me, to the left side. I think I said right side. If I didn't, um, there's the correction. Uh, in any case, I think this is a playable price tag for him at 5300 uh, Don't get me wrong. I want whiff stuff when I go after the Braves, uh, and I generally don't like doing this. I, you'll probably have to, I mean, if you land on this, you might get a couple of teams you just build you know, 150 or whatever, uh, because the price that there's upside at this price tag, he can pop for 20 and 25 here. Uh, and that's probably all you need tonight in particular. We're likely to see a, a good bit of offense once again, um, from some pretty obvious spots. So, uh, this cutter is a good, valuable pitch for him. He, it allows him to run deeper into games by keeping the baseball on the ground. So I think this is an okay play at 5,300. I don't want to go out of my way to do it because I hate going after Atlanta with sub, subpar strikeout guys but um i think dunning's made uh, some changes here and they could allow him to survive and i think his price tag's probably too cheap so uh mostly just texas here maybe some atlanta uh if you land on some stacks but once again they're very expensive you can make it happen yeah go ahead but um you know it's still pretty difficult to get to okay cubs and houston let's get to justin Steele on the mound this is one guy in this range i don't think you're going to be able to get to um 9500 it, it's just a pretty bad matchup Houston still, like, against lefties this season, look at this number, right? 15% strikeout rate, and this is more like what we're used to seeing uh, with Houston. Um, very, very low K rate, super difficult to get through, not striking out at all, not creating just yet, because they're not hitting a lot of, uh, for a lot of power, 164 ISO and 30% hard contact, but they are about a neutral ground ball to fly ball with a you know 19 20% line drive rate. So this is all fine. And this will come up this creation number as long as the average stays around 250 or so and the ISO stays this high. Uh, these numbers are going to start to drift up a little bit and especially if they get guys like Jose Abreu to heat up at all. Like he had an extra base hit last night somehow. I, I don't know how where that came from. But um, maybe starting to see the baseball a little bit better is Josie. He's still 2,700. I'm not sure I want to play him uh, or really stack Houston necessarily tonight. I really respect Justin Steele, but I think this price tag is just too high in this particular matchup. Um, he's got K stuff, and he's struggling a little bit with it, though, to the right side. And this is a terrible strikeout matchup in general, and I think the price tag is too high. So um, I like the stuff generally with a four-seamer slider mix. Really staying down in the strike zone, that'll typically yield about a fly ball lean. But so far, buck 60 ground ball to fly ball, really to both sides of the plate. That's encouraging because um, he's not throwing the sinker, curveball, or the changeup really at all. So he's mixing it up very well with this just these two pitches and getting a, a good bit of value and staying down in the strike zone. Um, but with a, such a low strikeout rate against righties here, uh, this is probably a, a pretty difficult spot. If you want to get some really off-the-board Houston stacks. Um, I mean, they're middling in, in value and way down the board in ownership. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. You want to play Mo Bone? He doesn't strike out. Alex Bregman probably starting to heat up a little bit. 45, that's fine. If you want to play some Jordan, yeah, you can play him every single day against everybody. Doesn't matter. 5,800 for him. Not super thrilled about that, but it's okay. And like I said, you could maybe consider the ghost of Jose Abreu at first base. Um some of these guys down at the bottom of the lineup, they've got Pop, Jeremy Pena, still 4,800 and hard to get to at shortstop uh, at that price and in the six hole or whatever. But it's okay in, in stacks if you want to uh, consider some of the Astros. Really not my favorite, though. Javier at 9,600 on the other side of the game. Um, he's going to be mega chalky. We're seeing the ownership actually drop a little bit. It was north of 40 in the early going this season, uh, or this morning, rather. Um I think the price tag's fine for Javier. There's plenty of upside, of course. We know that he's got a high strikeout rate, and he's very difficult to attack, to be quite honest. 
Um, historically, however, he's given up some pop to the right side, and that's really not changing so far this season. Still a four-seamer slider guy, and here's that fly ball lean. Got a lot of whiffs, uh, but not getting as much value out of the curveball here so far. It's basically break even. It's kind of whatever. But he'll still give up some pop to the right side when he floats the slider and and isn't spotting the four-seamer on the edges. He comes in a little bit three-quarters, similar to Luis Castillo kind of, um, and that'll give him a little bit of a fly ball lean, or it'll give him such a heavy fly ball lean, and it'll yield a little bit of power, as I mean to say, uh, against same-handed hitters. So you see it here, not so much in average, but a 292 Woba, it's about average there, 215 ISO, 228 X ISO here based on StatCast metrics. So um, 33.5% aggregate hard contact rate, most of it coming to right-handed hitters. 39% the pitch info here, 90 hitter sample, it's not nothing, 1.6 homers per nine. So he's still attackable because he still gets on the barrel. And with a lot of fly balls, a lot of hard contact, and barrels, like that's a perfect recipe. He doesn't, uh, the only thing we're missing really is a walk rate, but still has trouble getting ahead in counts at 57% strike one. He's got a lot of chase, though, and that's really what allows him to uh, sustain a sub-60% strike one rate and and get out of these holes. But really, he's only got two pitches. So if you want to get to some leverage stacks, this would be the one spot I would I would consider. Uh, the Cubs have been pretty bad recently, uh, but you know, they got some guys here that are starting to heat up. Chris Morell, he it just hits a dinger every day. He's 4,400, probably going to lead off while Nico is still on the shelf. Dansby is down to 4,000 flat. I think this is an okay spot. He'll strike out against right-handers for sure, and probably a, a good bit in this particular matchup. 35% strikeout rate has Javier to the righties. But 4,000 is 4,000 for Dansby. He's got plenty of pop. Ian Happ down to 41. Say a Suzuki, maybe heating up a little bit, 37. Patty Wisdom. Up there, I, he may still be leading the league in homers. He's at 42 now. Hopefully, they're going to bump him up to the five hole where we can actually play the guy. Uh, a lot of pop from the left side for Matt Mervis. And I think the Cubs are a playable leverage stack here. Now, usually, I don't like stacking against fly ball, heavy fly ball pitchers like this. So, I'd probably prefer just homer hunting and getting like a short stack with a Burrell, Dansby, Patty Wisdom type of deal. Um, but if you want to round out a full five, man, Ian Happ hits righties very well. That's not a problem. And you can throw in a Matt Mervis or a Say Suzuki if you'd like. I think this is a playable tournament stack here for the Cubs, and it'll get you leverage on about 35, 40% of the field. I think that's okay. Don't get me wrong. Cubs are still going to strike out here, I think, a little bit. Um, this is a high upside strikeout matchup for... Javier, it's because he's got such good K stuff himself, but 22% in aggregate for the in aggregate for the Cubs, 104 WRC plus, not a lot of power or hard contact coming for them, and they're going to hit some ground balls. So this is kind of why I think line drive wise and batted ball profile wise, this is an okay leverage stack to get to the Cubs, but in general. It's also an okay spot for Javier because he has good K stuff himself, and they don't hit for a lot of hard contact or power. You know, so it's uh, you can play both sides here. I think um, I'd probably just side with Javier, but I don't know. I, I think the Cubs are a very reasonable deep tournament three man or, or something like that. Um, so probably just offense here. Uh, no Justin Steele on the mound for me. Some Javier, yeah, and some Astros if we can make it happen. Um, but I think maybe some Cubs too. Okay, Cleveland and the White Sox. Another interesting pitching spot here for Shane Bieber. 9,000 for him. Projecting fine, generally, for a guy in this range. And normally, we'd like to get to this ownership with Bieber. However, he's only got a 19% K rate this year. The strikeout stuff has not been there at all. He's still throwing strike one and still throwing strikes two and three deeper into count. He's never walked people. He's always had a very high strike efficiency rate. But this season, the, the K stuff just isn't there yet. Um, he's historically had about a 24, 25% carry to the left side. That hasn't quite shown up yet. He's not able to bury the slider down in on the hands uh, like he, he usually likes to uh, against lefties, which gives him more K stuff against the left side. Um, it's a little less efficient in terms of the raw strikeouts against the right side usually, but this is... Again, two and three ticks below his historical averages. So I think it's going to make it pretty difficult 
with just a 10% aggregate strikeout rate to get to Bieber. Now, he's a very good tournament pivot off of a Zach Wheeler at 9,200, who we'll get to later, um, just in terms of ownership. The spot isn't all that excellent against the White Sox here. They're a little bit healthier now with Yohan Moncada and Tim Anderson back. 84 WRC plus, though, 143 ISO, 29% hard contact rate, a lot of ground balls here, too. So not walking, and it's going to probably be pretty difficult for the White Sox to get on base tonight outside of just picking apart Shane Bieber. And I think that is a little bit more probable than it has been in in, in the past. So um, not a... I mean, Bieber's probably just going to be on the shelf for me here today. Pitching to a little bit too much contact for my liking. I think a fine tournament spot if you land there. Can't quite get to the Zach Wheeler, but it's a, you know, not uh, something I'm going to be forcing in, I don't think. Lance Lynn on the other side, definitely not going to be forcing him in today. Not playing him against uh, against Guardians. They don't strike out at all. Uh, 20% strikeout rate in aggregate against righties. 78 WRC+, plus, however. 25% hard contact rate, 108 ISO, a lot of ground balls as well. So they're they're difficult to pick through because they just don't strike out. They're they're pesky hitters. And Lance Lynn really having a lot of problems with the left side of the plate this season. 350 average allowed, 466 WOBA, and a 350 ISO. Are you kidding me? 51% hard contact rate. So I hate doing this on full 12 game slates. So you might be able to play some of the Guardians here. Probably not in full stacks. It's going to be super difficult for that to get there because they don't hit for any power. But Lance Lynn's going to throw it over the damn plate, man. Strike one rate, 74%. This is astronomical. 26% K rate. He's still got some of the whiffs, but this hard contact number to the left side of the plate, it is like he's just throwing meatballs here. High, high barrel rate for him. And he's been very, very attackable. No chase here, so you can, you can play some of the Guardians, I think. If you want to, certainly, like, Stephen Kwan is 4,400 now. That's a playable piece. Probably not as a one-off, but you can play him in stacks. Josie Ramirez, of course, he's down to 52. I think that's playable, too. Josh Naylor, probably not my favorite first baseman at 3,300, but he's 33, and he might be heating up a little bit. Josh Bell probably stay off. Andres Jimenez, still kind of expensive for his performance so far this season at 41, but it's not terrible. So you've got some workable pieces from the left side of the plate to go after some Lance Lynn here. Guys that aren't going to strike out a lot, and he's going to throw, he's going to pitch to a hell of a lot of contact here. Four homers per nine? Yeah, it's 88 hitters, but like, I mean, this is a real worrisome number. So, uh, he's really struggling to find it here in the early going, so I'm not going near Lance Lynn. Mostly just Cleveland. Um, if you land on a couple of one-off White Sox pieces, I mean, okay, but Yo Moncada, 44, eh, sure. Tim Anderson, 48, eh, sure. You know, not not the greatest. Well down the list, I think. So mostly just the uh, mostly just the Guardians here. Uh, okay, let's try and speed this up a little bit. Cincinnati and Colorado, all offense only here, number one. Brandon Williamson making his Major League debut. Um, I'm not sure why they're doing this at Coors Field. I think they just need a guy to uh, eat some innings. Well, I'm not sure how many innings he's going to be able to eat here. He's got a, as I alluded to earlier, he's got an XFIP north of six in 21 starts in the upper minors over the last two seasons. Um, a, let's see here, 16% homer to fly ball rate this year. You know, it's fine, average, but just a nine, nine, nine and a half percent swinging strike rate with, ready for this, a 13% walk rate in the upper minors. Um, he's a starter. And he does start, so this isn't like bullpen noise or anything that we're getting out of that. But he's got uh, about an 18% aggregate strikeout rate and the 13, 13.5% walk rate. So no thank you. We're not dealing with any of this. Uh, you're going to want to get to a good bit of Colorado here tonight. And as we showed earlier, they're popping right up there with Cincinnati as uh, the most popular teams today. So um, you play pretty much everybody. We'll see what they want to do with the lineup. They're shuffling some guys around with C.J. Crone on the DL now. Um, but Brent Doyle hit two dingers last night. Michael Tolia is back up in the big leagues. High, high upside bat for them. Um, he'll hit from both sides, 2,900 first and outfield eligibility there. Almost certainly be in the lineup. And the, the kids, Zeke Tovar... And um, and and Brent Doyle. Hopefully they'll get some some lineup bumps today, and you can play them up near the top. I think it's a really good spot for the Rockies to kind of let their their young guys roll. Um, 
But yeah, play Chris Bryant, play, play Elias Diaz, play Randall Grichuk for sure. You can play Ryan McMahon too, because Brandon Williams, Williamson is not going to be in the game all that long. Uh, on the other side, Chase Anderson, also not likely to be in the game very long. Not stretched out, just got DFA'd from somebody. I forget where exactly. But the Rockies did just pick him up because everybody in their starting rotation is hurt. So they got to shuffle a bunch of guys. They've lost four of their starting pitchers. Uh, so they got to do something. And here's Chase Anderson. So 5,200 for him, not playing him. He's only going to go probably two innings. Rockies' bullpen has been good, but we talked about this yesterday. Their bullpen, they, they got to eat a lot of innings here, man. And they're eventually just going to get totally blown apart. Uh, it's coming. I don't know when, but it may very well be today. So we're just going to have to stack against them uh, at every opportunity. Um, and today certainly qualifies once again. It's going to be a little bit warmer than it was last night at Coors Field. I think you probably see 65, 70 degrees first pitch, somewhere around there. Um, they've dealt with a, a good bit of rain recently in Colorado. So uh, that, I think, is probably cleared and, and starting to move across the country a little bit. So um, probably a, a pretty good day for baseball uh, at Coors Field. And the Reds' prices, well, you just got to eat them again. Because they haven't, as I mentioned earlier, they haven't changed the price on Matt McClain. He's still at 2,000 flat. Johnny India popped up a little bit, 55 now, but like whatever. Jake Fraley still 42. Spencer Steer, Steer popped up to 35 from 34, whatever. Tyler Stevenson still 48, still playable. Senzel up to 46 from 45. So uh, everybody else, I mean, so it looks like an aggregate. Most everybody got maybe a $100 price bump. So, like, I mean, you just got to play them again. Um, they'll probably roll the same sort of lineup. Maybe move Fraley to the two or something like that. But they're mostly right-handed heavy um, anymore. So it's probably going to be pretty similar to what you saw yesterday. And you can, just, you can play everybody because historically, Chase Anderson has given up more power and more production to the right side of the plate. He's always been a reverse split guy, and that's not really going to change. Four-seamer cutter change mix here in the early going. Um, he's always had a pretty decent change, which neutralizes the power to the left side. Uh, but like, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's Fraley, he's 4,200 and the kid rakes, uh, and he's a Coors Field. So play him anyway. So offense only here and no starting pitching for sure. You just got to balance the ownership once again. Okay. Arizona and Oakland. I think you're going to be able to get to some offense here too. Tommy Henry, he has a 10% uh, strikeout rate in his four starts this season. Like, what are we doing? 57% strike one, having a little bit of trouble there. Elevated 10% walk rate, so it's not like ballooning, but it's still, you know, long term. It, it, he's got a 0% K minus walk rate. Zero. Like, this is like unheard of. So you, you could play some Oakland because this team over here, you ready for this? This is not the same old Oakland Athletics. 112 WRC plus with a 21% K rate against left handed pitching. Bucks 58 ISO playing in Oakland. I mean, yeah, it's a shortish sample, 450 PAs, whatever. Not a lot of hard, but they're going to get the baseball on a line and in the air. And they've been sticky all season, as we've talked about a couple of times. I believe their last outing against a lefty, an above-average lefty, was uh, Martin Perez. And they hit like three or four bombs off of him. Um, who He didn't give up any power at all. So... Tommy Henry, really a below average lefty, probably only going to go about four, four and a third here, something like that, um, because I think Oakland's going to be able to put together a little bit of offense. You don't want to play them in a full 12 game or in full stacks necessarily with so many different offenses that we can get to tonight, but you play in Asturio Ruiz, Jordan Diaz, Brent Rooker, Jesus Aguilar. Don't really want to play him at 26 at first base on a full 12 gamer, but he didn't strike out at all. You play Ramon Laureano, every one of these dudes is cheap. They're all under 3,300 3, or less um, outside of Brent Rooker, who's 4,300. So you can make this work if you need to get to a couple of very expensive arms on the mound. Very playable. I don't want anything to do with Tommy Henry at 5,600. I'd rather just play Dane Dunning against Braves in an equally scary matchup. Uh, 5K for Kyle Muller on the mound for the A's. No thank you. Uh, we're also not doing this because... Well, he doesn't have any K stuff himself, right? 15% aggregate strike rate, strike rate uh, aggregate K rate, rather. 54% strike one rate and a 11.5% walk rate. So, uh, no, definitely not. And 35% hard contact for the D-backs against lefties this season. 98 WRC+. They're not striking out a whole hell of a lot either. 22% aggregate. 
not hitting for a, a bunch of power and a lot of ground balls, so that makes lefties a little more serviceable in general. But um, Kyle Moe is not going to throw it past these guys, and his best pitch is a slider. He doesn't have anything else equitable, so he'll be fine against lefties, but not so much against the righties, and we see that kind of playing out here in the numbers. 328 average allowed. Excuse me. 395 Woba, 180 ISO realized with a 224 X ISO. So huge, huge numbers here. 41% aggregate hard contact rate. Uh, that's to both sides of the plate. No, thank you. We're not dealing with this. I think you can play Arizona once again um, and try and capitalize on some of the walks and some barrels here. And we kind of mentioned this uh, a little bit today. This barrel rate is a very, very key metric. Uh, when you're on the barrel and you're also walking people and you're giving up balls in the air, like that's really the perfect recipe. Kyle Muller will keep it on the ground a little bit more, uh, but that's when you can get to line drive and fly ball hitters like a Lourdes Gurriel, a Christian Walker who got a day off yesterday, Evan Longoria, high fly ball hitter against lefties still. Uh, Manny Rivera, he'll likely be in the 2, 3,000 flat at third base, playable piece. Cattell Marte hits from both sides at 4,900. So, uh, Corbin Carroll probably staying off of that 5,300 price tag in particular today, but if you're building a bunch of Arizona teams, you're not going to fade him at all, right? Um, play him against lefties, play him against righties, especially against below average lefties. Uh, it doesn't really matter with Corbin Carroll. So, plenty of playable spots here for Arizona once again, and um, definitely not Tommy Henry on the mound, uh, really, or, or Kyle Muller. I think we can get to some sneaky offense Pretty much uh, all, all the way around here. Arizona is not going to be so sneaky. Oakland, maybe a little bit more so. Okay, Kansas City and uh, San Diego. Brady Singer on the mound. You can probably get to some offense here once again. Um, uh, Brad Keller, we talked about the walks. He walked eight batters last night. Uh, I don't know. Like, they're going to have to do something with him. Now, Singer is not walking that many people, but he's still on the, on the barrel here at 13 percent this is like the third highest number on the day and this is terrible uh, look at these hard contact numbers really to both sides and, and not so short dish samples yeah it's only 100 hitters to either side but 44 and a half percent hard contact rate to the lefties with a 285 realized iso it's a big number there high average to both sides too expected batting average 300 391 x wobo with a 249 x iso to both sides you can attack all of this, even though he's not walking a lot of people, there's no chase in, in Singer here. He may be a victim here of the pitch clock. I mean, he normally works really, really quickly, so I'm not sure what the what the issue is. Um, I'm going to have to dig into Singer a little bit more, but he's been really wearing it. He's had to um, he's had to eat a couple big numbers a couple of times this season, and I think this is a pretty bad spot trying to go after the Padres. There were also... Like I said, Keller walked eight guys last night, and they just couldn't make it happen for the Padres. Um, but they're still pretty patient, right? Against right-handers, here you go, 12% walk rate. They're still going to get on base and, and take good at bats, and good veteran at bats. Now, uh, Manny Machado did get hit in the hand last night. We'll have to keep an eye on him, probably give him a day off. Uh, but that might make their, you know, might give him a, a chance to clear his head. He's been not great at the plate recently. So, and it might give their lineup a little bit more playability. Soto's price finally came up 5,700. You can certainly play him up on Xander to 49. Cronenworth still at, at a playable 41. Tatis at 62. You can play him every day too. Carp still at 26. You can play that as well as you can. You play Hassan Kim 3,200 makes a lot of contact. So, um, Padres stacks once again, probably similar to a lot of the rest of the field in terms of Padres stacks, because they're kind of difficult to uh, to stack. Not a lot of multi-position eligibility outside of Hassan Kim and Jake Cronenworth. But um, as of right now, coming in pretty middling in in value, and same thing in ownership. So uh, very playable stack targeting Brady Singer over here, and this very low chase rate. The guy's going to throw strikes. But he's going to pitch to a lot of contact and really not eking out a lot of value, giving up way too much hard contact here and balls in the air. So, uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, Padres have uh, Seth Lugo on the mound going for them. 8,000. Eh, I'm kind of lukewarm on this. Uh, I'm not really sure what I want to do here. I'll probably leave him on the shelf. I don't know. But Michael Walker, we saw what the, he did to them last night. 
um, really had his changeup working finally. And historically, that's been his best pitch. Now, Seth Lugo, historically, his better pitch is really the curveball. Um, not eking enough value out of that. He's throwing it a ton here. It's just got kind of to break even. So he's not getting a lot of whiffs just yet. And that kind of makes him a little difficult to play at a slightly elevated price tag. I think I'd rather get to some Royals here again tonight. Um, he's given up some pop to the left side here. 189 realized ISO with an aggregate 193x ISO to both sides of the plate. So I think he's attackable with both sides here. Very low strikeout rate so far to the righties. And that's because he doesn't have really anything down in the strike zone like a same-handed change. Uh, or a slide or the curveball, like I said, he's throwing this a bit more up in the strike zone, trying to get whiffs. Um, not necessarily the a raw whiff pitch, similar to like a uh, um, a Charlie Morton, something like that, who does get a lot of whiffs on on the curveball. Uh, in any case, I think he's attackable with some stacks here. I don't really want to stack the Royals on a full 12 game slate. Because they're well, they're the Royals. They're pretty bad. Not a lot of power. Hard contact, though. We talk about this. They keep making hard contact, and this is going to be on a line in the air here. So it makes them playable and it makes them attractive. Um, this is why I keep getting sucked into playing the freaking Royals. But uh, I mean, this has happened for years. It's just it's their cheap price tags and their they're fine underlying metrics, but damn, are they disappointing? Uh, you you play Bobby Witt and Salvi Perez. Really, both of those guys. Issues are or is chase right and Seth Lugo not displaying a lot of chase right now as we said the curveball is a little bit up in the strike zone so uh, I think the righties here are playable with a very low 16% strikeout rate for Lugo um, but you can play the lefties definitely Vinny hopefully trying to break out of the slump he's been in uh, had a base hit last night after you know snapping like an 0 for 20 or something like that 3800 he's still fine MJ at 35 you can play him definitely. Uh, Nick Prado, still at 27, you can play him as well. So if you want to round out a full five, man, that's probably how I'd play it. You can play an Eddie Olivares or a Michael Massey or something like that as well if you need it to stack against Lugo. Not super crazy about it, like I said. Maybe some short stacks or, or, or some one-off pieces of the Royals targeting a pretty vulnerable arsenal over here. But good fastball mix. If he establishes, he's still going to throw strikes and not walk people. So um, and we saw what strike throwers can do to a lineup like this uh in in what michael walker did last night so he doesn't have the change and that's why i kind of lean a little bit more to the royals here tonight than i did last night and i really leaned to the royals last night because i wanted to target walker but that didn't really work out so that said yeah maybe if you land on some seth luke i'm not you know, I'm not super jacked about it. Very high projection so far and pretty low ownership given that projection in this range. So um, playable and you'll probably land on him if you build some teams. But I don't know. Uh, Arsa, I'm not super impressed with it. It's mostly just because this is the Royals and they're terrible. But San Diego for sure. Uh, okay, Philly and San Francisco. Let's try and um, get through this quickly. Zach Wheeler, I want to play him for sure. 9,200. Giants are missing their best left-handed hitter against right-handed pitching. And Jock Peterson, he's on the DL now. Um, serves him right for trying to bunt. And the rest of these guys, they're going to get a little bit more right-handed heavy tonight. Um, they do have lefties. They're still going to platoon plenty, right, with Lamont Wade, Michael Conforto, Brandon Crawford. Uh, and a couple guys down at the bottom of the lineup, like a uh, a Blake Sable or a, a Brett Wisely. So they'll have those guys in the lineup, but they'll be a little bit more right-handed heavy. It's not going to be nine right or nine lefties against Zach Wheeler here, like it may have been a couple of weeks ago um, for the Giants. So you can attack J.D. Davis, and you can attack Mitch Haniger, and you can attack a young hitter, Casey Schmidt, and a Tyro Estrada and the downside of their platoons. So, and this is Zach Wheeler. It looks to be heating things up a little bit, and I think uh, we're finally starting to get mid-season Zach Wheeler. Um, three of his last four starts have been fantastic, and he's been above 10K in each of those starts, 10-7, 10-6, 10-7. And well, I guess he was a uh, on the showdown slate against that in that start against Colorado where he struck at 11. But the strikeout stuff's been there in the last several starts: 11, 7, 5, and 7 Ks in six innings, six innings, five and a third, and seven innings in his last four. So um, 
the run suppression is is still there. He's figuring out the walks, the controls coming back. We talked about a little bit of susceptibility with spraying the baseball um, here in the early going, but that's just early season Zach Wheeler. But it's mostly the price tag here, and I I'm kind of surprised at this ownership. It's because of the other guys at the top garnering so much. But I would really like to go after the Giants here tonight. I think uh, and play some Zach Wheeler. This is a very high projection. And it's going to be pretty hard, I think, to not land on a lot of this. Um, and this is kind of what I meant when you when I said you're going to have to make some decisions and just like X some guys at the top of at the top of the pricing spectrum when you've got so many of them that project well. And this is the guy I was really had in I really had in mind with that comment. And um, I like getting to this a lot tonight. I think the Giants are still going to strike out a lot. 25% aggregate K rate. Yeah. WRC plus they'll create, they'll hit for some power with some hard contact, but this is a below at well below average matchup and uh, it, contact matchup that is. And despite Zach Wheeler giving up a little bit of hard to the left side of the plate so far this year, still not translating quite yet into a lot of ISO it's a little bit of average 267 whatever you know you don't want any of these righties against him so he'll be able to pick through this lineup I think and survive pretty well um and attack some guys that are still going to strike out so I like Wheeler uh, a pretty good bit here tonight I think you play Alex Cobb on the other side too 8700 for him now the strikeout stuff is down a little bit and that's mostly just to the lefties um, not burying the slider into curveball, not getting as much whiff on the split as he normally does, but he's down about three, four ticks compared to last year. So I think this is just early season noise for Alex Cobb. I don't see anything markedly different uh, in the pitch mix or anything. I dug into him a little bit, and everything looks mostly similar. Um, sinker's still good. Splitter's still good. Ground ball rate's still very high. So I think you could play a little bit of Alex Cobb the Phillies this season against righties, 108 WRC plus create a little bit, but also a 24% K rate. Difference here is that 29% hard contact rate is a very attackable number. Of course, they have Harper back, but and and he'll increase this number you know, pretty significantly. But I think this is still attackable here. I don't really want to play any of the Phillies uh, against this kind of ground ball rate. Um you know, at a very low line drive rate, too. 16% is a, an elite number. Too many ground balls and strikeouts that that Alex Cobb can eke out here. He's really got this split going. I think you can very reasonably play an 8,700 Alex Cobb at very low ownership tonight. Good projection for him as well. Um, you could even consider... You could, could play both of these guys in cash if you want. Um, I think this is a, a reasonable tournament play as well. I think Alex Cobb got some hidden upside in this particular matchup doesn't walk people and he throws strikes. He stays off the barrel. And despite some elevated hard contact, once again, we don't really care when it's this, this high a ground ball rate. So uh, I like this spot a little bit for Alex Cobb as well. So mostly pitching just in this game. Um, I don't want any offense. I mean, sure. You want to play a very hot Michael Conforto 3,400 or something. Sure. Um, but I don't want any of the Phillies. I mean, if they burn me, they burn me, but you want to pay six K and 52 for Harper and Schwarber and, and Castellanos, 49. Trey Turner, 53 tonight. By Bryson Stott at 4,800? I, I don't think so. So just uh, just pitching there for me. Okay, last game of the night, Minnesota and the Dodgers. Um, well, Pablo made me look like an idiot. It was more so the Dodgers made me look like an idiot. Um, so I ate that one pretty good. Unfortunately, that's kind of the, the Dodgers, man. This this offense is really rolling right now. And they, like they're 17-4 and four, their last 21 games or something like this. Um, this is still the best team in the NL West. And despite the Padres maybe having a better lineup on paper coming into the season, I mean, you still got to do it on the field. And really, the, Dodge, the Dodgers' weakness has been starting pitching. And now that they're healthy in the lineup with Will Smith, J.D. Martinez, I mean, they're really not missing a beat. I mean, yeah, they're missing Gavin Lux or whatever, but they've had Miguel Vargas step in at second base. He's been fantastic. Um Plenty of guys now that they're healthy to piece together uh, a very serviceable lineup. And as long as they can figure out the stuff on the mound, Kershaw has been excellent for them. Of course, uh, Urias has been pretty damn good too. As long as they can figure out the starting pitching in the bullpen, uh, this is still the best team. One of the best teams in baseball. Um, and certainly the best team in the NOS. It ain't the Padres. So that said, uh, 
Dodgers are going to make me look like an idiot quite often, I think, because I'm still going to attack them sometimes with very high upside pitchers. I'm not sure Bailey Ober is one of them. 8,500. We like him against very right-handed heavy lineups. Super elite K stuff against the right side. That's a good four-seamer, good slider curveball mix. It's a changeup that leaves it on the table for him. That makes him way more susceptible to the left side. Uh, in terms of contact and in terms of power. Now, this is a short sample here, so we're not going to see all of these power numbers really reflected. Uh, but you do see more of the the true numbers, I, I suppose, um, against right-handers. 32% K rate nearly. This is what it's been in the, in the minors for him, and really displayed the same sort of K stuff against righties in the, in the majors as well. He's a heavy fly ball pitcher, and that's very dangerous against the Dodgers because if you give up this kind of hard contact number and these kind of fly balls, uh, a ball's going to go over the wall, whether to righties or to lefties. Um, so I don't think we're going to be able to play Bailey over here at 8,500 tonight. Um, probably a bit too expensive. I don't know. Maybe not even interesting at like 6,500, to be quite honest. Uh, Dodgers are just very difficult to attack with all but the elite the most elite of elite arms. Um, I think Pablo Lopez does qualify there, and they even picked him apart pretty good. So no Bailey over on the mound. Just the Dodgers, I think. You could play him for sure. Will Smith, 4,600 now. Max Muncy is going to hit two homers every damn night. I've mentioned this a couple of times. 5,300, that's fine. Freddie, I like. He's probably my favorite price-adjusted play, uh, at least from the left side. Uh, I do really like Will Smith, 4,600. Doesn't strike out a lot against righties. Uh, James Outman, I think, is fine, too. Mookie at 59, a little stiff there, but uh, you could play some of the Dodgers for sure. Kershaw on the mound for them, 11,000. Yeah, I mean, you can play Kershaw. I'm not jacked about a full 11,000 price tag here, but uh, the Twins against lefties this season, well, uh, they've left quite a bit on the table. 311 PA, 77 WRC plus here, 27% strikeout rate. 33% hard, so they'll make a little bit of hard and hit for a little bit of power. A lot of fly balls, but a lot of them are popped up, right? So they're not, excuse me, going over the wall necessarily, and they're striking out a crap load. So I think you can get to some Kershaw definitely. It's going to make it hard because he's 11,000, and there's probably some expensive stacks you want to play. So it's that's what's keeping his ownership down here, but it's not like a projection. It's not, nothing in the pitch mix or, or fundamentals or anything. He's been He's been elite pretty much everywhere. Um, inducing a lot of soft contact, staying off of the barrel, like doesn't walk people, throwing a hell of a lot of strikes, 71.5% strike one rate. Look at this chase rate, 40%. That's up there. This is Gosman territory. and This is like Pete Kershaw that we're seeing um, in the latter few years of his career here. So now that he's healthy, he's still one of a one of the best arms in baseball. So you can absolutely play this if you can make it happen price-wise. Uh, I've got no issues with this at all. Uh, really don't even want, like, hedge leverage pieces against uh, or from the Twins here. Um, Buxton may be heating up a little bit, but he's going to strike out a lot in this particular matchup. Correa down to 3,900. Um, you got some cheap price tags on these guys. They're kind of getting a little bit of the Kershaw treatment. Um, that we saw several years ago, but I don't really want to go after Kirsch. If he gets tagged for a couple of runs, I'm just going to have to wear it, I think. Uh, so mostly just the Dodgers here in the nightcap. Uh, okay, so we are done here. Let's quickly go over stacks. Yankees, Toronto. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really want any offense here in this game, I don't think. Probably both just Gosman and Domingo Herman. I think it's a good tournament play here. Tampa and the Mets. Ugh. Mets are going to pop maybe a little bit. I don't really want to play offense here either, really, or pitching. I think Verlander is probably just going to sit on the shelf for me today. I don't like going after Tampa. Um, may make me look very stupid, though. Seattle and Boston. Seattle, definitely. I think you play a little bit of Boston, too. But I don't hate playing some very low-projected Luis Castillo. He had super low ownership here. He's going to be completely ignored in this top end. Uh, makes him a very good tournament play in correlated stacks. Milwaukee, St. Louis... Uh, probably no, no Milwaukee. I like Montgomery a little bit here. St. Louis, yeah, you can go after Wade Miley. He's having trouble throwing strike one here. Um, Atlanta and Texas, Jared Schuster on the mound, Texas only uh, against him. And Dane Dunning, you might be able to play as well, 5,300. I don't like going after Atlanta. Super dangerous spot. Low strikeout rate historically for Dane Dunning, but he might be able to survive at that price tag. Cubs in Houston, maybe some Cubs 
leverage stacks here. I like Javier for sure, don't get me wrong, and I like Houston a little bit, um, but I might like the Cubs a little bit more. I don't know. Uh, Cleveland and the White Sox, probably just some Guardians here. A little bit of Bieber if you could make it happen, but I'm not super thrilled about it. No Lance Lynn, I don't think, and none of the White Sox. Cincinnati and Colorado offense only, of course. Both of them uh, just got to swing ownership and, and figure out how to make that happen. Arizona and Oakland, like Arizona again, like a little bit of Oakland too. No pitching here for me. Casey and San Diego. Uh, San Diego, definitely. I think Brady Singer's really been wearing it this season. Um, if you want to land on Brady, I really don't want to land on Brady Singer. He's 6,100, so he's probably got upside at this price tag. But uh, I don't know. He's really struggling so far this year. San Diego mostly. Seth Lugo, eh, all right, whatever. Philly and San Francisco, pitching only here. I like both of these guys on the mound. And in the late game, the Dodgers and Minnesota, pretty much just the Dodgers and a lot of Kershaw. So that's where we are, guys. Keep an eye out for projection updates as always. And good luck to everybody punting on this huge 12-game Tuesday.